Good morning, Barbara. Can you hear me okay? Good morning, Barbara. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you now. How can you hear me okay? Okay, fabulous. Yeah, so hi, my oh, name's Rachel. You've, you've gone again. Okay, fabulous. Yeah, so hi, my name's Rachel. Um, uh, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to make you host. Um, um, uh, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to make you host. And I'm going to hand um, and what I'll do is if anybody comes in during the um, session, and what I'll do is if I'll anybody comes in well. during the um, session, so just I'll let them in as well. Our live on um, so just let them are live on YouTube. All right. Okay. Uh, so good morning, everybody, and welcome. All right. To uh, so good morning, everybody, and um, welcome to Digital um, I'd like to introduce Barbara Burgess. Um, I'd like to introduce Barbara Burgess. Who's going to be talking, with, like Barbara Barbara Burgess, going to be talking with us? Until half past seven. Okay, go ahead, Barbara. Okay, go ahead, Barbara. Hi there. Can everybody see me? Because I can't see myself at the moment. It's quite an interesting situation. Yep. Yep. Okay. So I'm going to talk to you about spiritual business, conscious business. Um, interesting fact that I came across while I was going through all my notes. Entrepreneurs feel closer to God than the rest of the population does. Well, they're clearly not all narcissists, so it's quite interesting what's going on here. And a study in the Netherlands has even suggested that it's good for entrepreneurs to be more spiritual or religious. It's concerned with risk-taking and purpose. If you believe you're here for a purpose, you're more likely to take calculated risks. And to be honest, being a entrepreneur is all about taking calculated risks. A couple of years ago, I was on a panel for a training day talking about inspired leadership. And during a break, this guy came up to me and said, I've got these strong spiritual beliefs. It's part of who I ha am, but I don't have a language that allows me to bring them into my business life. In a world where we're being asked to be true, authentic selves, it seems to be a bit of a major problem. But there was a time in my life where I'd have thought it was probably a good thing that business didn't have religion and spirituality in it. And in fact, there was no place in spirit for spiritual beliefs in business. You see, as a child, I'd seen religion split my mother's family. Her parents were a Scottish Presbyterian and a Geordie Roman Catholic of Irish descent. I think you can probably imagine some of the issues that were going to come up here. The sons were brought up as Catholics and the girls were allowed to decide for themselves. My mother became ostensibly Protestant, but I think it was more to do with the era than any particular strong beliefs on her part. It was just kind of expected that you went to church. But the rift came when one of the sons decided to marry a Protestant in a Church of England ceremony. His brother said he wasn't married in the eyes of God. He was living in sin. It caused a major rift, which lasted for the rest of their lives. And the odd occasion when we saw that particular uncle, that always seemed to end up in some sort of argument about religion. It was quite a strange start in my life to look at religion like that. But as a child, it intrigued me most that someone could believe something so strongly that they were sure they were the only ones who was right. And this fascination for religion and the and beliefs followed me into, well, current day. But in my teenage years, I decided I was going to read the Bible cover to cover. I then went on to the Quran, the Vedas, the Bhagavad Gita, Buddhist Sutras, the Tao Te Ching, on and on. Possibly not what you'd expect of most teenagers. But actually, the more I think about it now, the more I think teenagers are looking for something that gives meaning to their lives. That's probably why I, when I was listening to the news recently about 
um, Muslim fundamentalism and how that takes over. And it's that those sort of years when they're looking for something that gives meaning. But the more I read, the less I could believe in any one of them. And it struck me how certain teachings and even phrases cropped up in various texts. And whilst they all had something to say, none of them fed my need for answers. But there's still something comforting about the idea that people can believe in any one of these so strongly that it informs everything they do. And I actually remember wishing I had that, wishing I could believe, but knowing I actually couldn't. 25 years on and having gone down rabbit holes with philosophy, existentialism, neoplatonism, comparative religion, mythology, I was starting to get the real understanding that beneath the surface imagery, they were all the same. Then I had my epiphany. It came completely unexpectedly, not from an intellectual journey, but from a personal road to Damascus moment. And it didn't fit any of the religions I'd investigated, although in some ways it fitted them all. So when I set up my business, it was based on strong spiritual beliefs, but my business was about helping people deal with issues of who they really were what their purpose was and how to remove all the obstacles and beliefs and indoctrinations that stop them from being their true authentic selves. I wasn't an accountant or a manufacturer. So it set me thinking, could there be a role for spirituality in business that were more mainstream? Could there be a role for spirituality in commerce or law or technology? So I took his question away that day and mulled on it. My first thought was that it had worked for the Quakers, Cadbury's, Roundtree's, Lloyd's, Barclays, Clark's. They were all Quaker businesses originally. And these businesses were successful because of the spiritual beliefs of their founders. In a time when you were expected to barter for things, they put the price on them, and that's what you paid. In a time when they might, when you might find added sawdust in your flour, they provided exactly what they said it was. Quakers were known for their honesty and their transparency. They looked after their employees, which is how come you get the places like the Bourneville village, Clark's village, places like that. They believed in truth and equality. They even had female managers overseeing the women that worked for them. They grew ethical businesses. But my next thought, as it always is with me, is, is there any scientific research on this? As you may, may have guessed by now, I'm a bit of a researcher, and if something doesn't stand up to scientific scrutiny, I tend to dismiss it. I'd love to explain how my spiritual beliefs can fall into that category, but that's another story and would take much longer to explain here. But there was a surprising amount of it. So as lockdown hit, I disappeared down another rabbit hole. So, so to start, I think we really need to define spirituality because it's not religion, although religion should incorporate spirituality. Spirituality is the domain of the inner self, not separate and apart from others, but inextricably linked, connected. And whereas re religion has rules and beliefs and a framework in which to discover the spiritual self, Spirituality is a basic desire to find ultimate meaning and purpose in your life, a life and live an integrated life. 
It's one that people don't want to confine to one day a week. Generally, the research suggests that most people feel that religion is not suitable for the workplace, whereas spirituality is. The, the overall thought was they saw it as interconnectedness. Interestingly, where organisational spirituality seems to increase employee well-being, organisational organizational religion in the workplace is negatively correlated. My other question based on, on what he was saying was, is there really a need out there? I mean, clearly he had a need. And he had a language that he used in his normal private life, but he felt that language wasn't suitable for business life. But one thing the research has uncovered is that even in the UK, which in many ways and statistically is more dismissive of organisational religion than most other countries, only 13% of people agreed with the statement that humans are purely material beings with no spiritual element. I've noticed, and perhaps you have too, that over the last 40 years or so in business, the lexicon of spirituality has crept into the boardroom. Ideas that resonate, conscious business, manifestation, even the law of attraction snuck in. Then we have practices such as meditation, yoga, gratitude, all coming directly from spiritual basis. But for most companies, those are just tacked onto their business model, just as ethical impact pages are tacked onto their websites. Neither are intrinsic or endemic to the culture. We still have issues with talking about spirituality, soul, hope and love within a business context. Even though most of us have, have a sense of what they mean in their lives, it has been a case of leaving the door when it comes to business. Unfortunately, that's probably because they can't be measured or seen, even though the effects of them can. It has been known for quite some time that children brought up without love or hope are affected not just emotionally, but physically. They fail to thrive and their brains don't develop properly. And many of us have seen through the last couple of years the effects that isolation can have on our mental health. We need connection, we need love, and we need physical touch. But there is a new generation of workers coming into the workforce. They are on average better, better educated and qualified as much because they had no choice as anything else. But more importantly, they're looking for more from their jobs and their pay than a, just a paycheck. Now, during the lockdown, one of the things I did was start helping people with CVs because a lot of people were looking for jobs. A lot of students had their internships and, and, and first jobs dropped because nothing was happening. And one of the things that kept cropping up is that they were saying that they were spiritual and they wanted to, to put something in their CV which showed that the spirituality was important to them insofar as it, it drove what they did and drove their feeling of service. Of course, they wanted equality and diversity, environmental consciousness, all those things that we hear about all the time. But they were also looking for a purpose and a meaning in what they and their companies do. They're looking for self-actualization and empowerment. And they're looking for well-being and spiritual growth. What they're demanding is transcendence. Transcendence. That part of Maslow's hierarchy of needs that's been ignored to the point where it probably hasn't even been there on the pyramid. 
that's shown in most management trainings is forgotten pin pinnacle. Transcendence describes existence or experience that's beyond the normal or physical level. It focuses on things beyond the self, like altruism, spiritual awakening, liberation from egocentricity, and the unity of being. It's a perspective shift from a more materialistic and rational view of life, leading to significant changes in the way of perceiving the self, relationships with other people, and life as a whole. And as we started going through the lockdown and towards coming out, I think we all started to see a perspective shift. People are questioning the world that they had before. Well, well a percentage want to go back and were desperate to go back to buying and shopping as a, as a pastime. I think a lot of people thought there's, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a different way. And I've heard all sorts of different ideas and thoughts on this. I think um, Mary Portis and her kindness economy, the information that she's giving you and coming and, and what's coming out of what she's talking about comes directly from the research on spiritual organizations. People are beginning to expect their spiritual value, values to be respected in the workplace because those spiritual values inform their service and also become an intrinsic reward in a spiritual organization. Customers too are demanding that companies support their values and they're loyal to companies that do. In the past, businesses may have seen this as a branding issue it was more about the image than the reality, but now consumers are looking at their story. They want to know what they're actually doing to fulfill those values. So going back to the research, one, one of the things that was quite interesting was the benefits of allowing spirituality in the workplace, because they're exactly the benefits that most organizations are trying to achieve. Case studies have shown is an up to 60% increase in productivity, up to an 80% increase in organisational commitment, 20% increase in employees' life satisfaction, 32% growth in social responsibility, and 13% growth in sales. They also show increased employee health and mental well-being, reduced absenteeism and staff turnover, and employees feel more creative and flexible. It's hard to argue with that. From a consumer's point of view, a spiritual organisation is trustworthy and caring, and service is its byword. So we could look back at the Quakers to get a sense of what a spiritual organisation might look like. Values driven people-centric, fair, transparent, trustworthy, but is there something more to it than that? For the participants in of a number of surveys, they see it as the opportunity to bring their whole person to engage in meaningful work. One thing that becomes very clear from the research, spiritual organisations are at their most successful when it comes from the leadership down. As one researcher said, the leader's interiority has far-reaching consequences because the leader unconsciously projects his or her interior life onto the relationships and the entire organisational culture. And I think we've seen that in the last 20 or 30 years in leaders whose interiority wasn't particularly good, where they are short tempered because something else in their life is affecting things. And you can see that moving on and moving through the business because it affects everybody down through the business. 
but there are a number of different models for spiritual organisations and what seems to show up in all of them is community and collaboration. And they tend to be flatter structures. Not such it's not so hierarchical as we're quite as we're used to, where cross-functional teams come together for a purpose or a project. There's free flow of information because of this. There are fewer levels of management, so that top management aren't so distant and out of touch with frontline workers. Most important, to identify emerging failures, leaders can interact with frontline employees and get a feel for how their decisions are being implemented and learn about unin any un unintended side effects. Those observations are then brought back to the top leadership team and can be reviewed and different actions taken. Spiritual businesses have a vision and purpose that are transparent so that everyone in the company knows and understands how their job fits in. How important they are to the business. And one value that stands out in all models is an ethic based on rights, duties and obligations doing what's right, even if it doesn't always translate into greater profits or immediate benefits to the company, rather than doing what's best for the company, even if it hurts individuals. Best in this case is defined in, as actions whose benefits outweigh the associated costs. It's counterintuitive. It's a bit like parallel skiing where you have to lean down the hill to, to, to turn. It feels like you're going to fall, but actually you go the opposite direction. Counterintuitive, but in the longer term, it actually works. So when we're talking about spirituality, bringing spirituality into the workplace, we're talking about changing the organisational culture so that humanistic and spiritual practices and policies of generosity, caring, goodness, gratitude, recognition and respect become an integral part of the organisation's day-to-day function. It permits employees to feel valued, have the freedom to develop themselves, to be empowered. Highly competent, self-managed and continuously learning. To achieve success in the form of a life that's rich, full, meaningful and significant. It's rooted in an awareness that the underlying context for all purposeful activity is spiritual in nature, not just utilitarian via the pursuit of material gain. It's an awareness that what we do what we produce. If it affects the planetary environment will ultimately affect us in progressively shorter periods. It's based in an awareness of the interdependencies of each of us, on community, on environment, that we are a system within a system, like the vascular system in the body at once interdependent interdependent and personally responsible. And I think for me that's probably the most important part is the inter interdependence because we're starting to realize and understand how we spend a third of our lives at least at work Mental health has been a major issue in the last couple of years. Employee engagement has been rising over and over again as a, as a problem in business. And we're look, all looking at different models, different ways of running business. But we kind of need to 
a step back and say, if I have spiritual beliefs, if I believe that I am more than just a fast moving as automaton in a in a world of ongoing jobs, do this, do that, busy work. We lose our heart, we lose our energy, we lose our purpose, but we also lose our mental health and our spiritual health. Thank you very much. I'd really like you to think about this and how you might be able to bring bring it into your business. Thank you very much, Barbara, for your talk today. Thank you very much, Barbara, for your talk today. Um, if you'd like to share your contact details as well, the best way. For um, if you'd like to share your contact details as well, the best way for anybody. OK, what in the chat room? You can do it in the chat or you can say it now as this is being recorded. You can do it in the chat or you can say it now as this is being recorded. OK, so I'm Barbara Burgess. You can find me on bar barbaraburgess.com. I my telephone number and all, all my contact details are there. I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter. Everything will be found on barbaraburgess.com. Super. Thank you very much for joining us today. Super. Thank you very much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure and thank you very much for inviting me. All right. Lovely. You take care. Thank you, Barbara. All right. Lovely. You take care. Thank you, Barbara. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.